Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory always. Amen. Uh, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're asking, Lord, that your word of truth just come to us in a way that fills us with excitement. Thank you that we can be here, but most important, Lord, we're asking for your presence to reveal itself in and through our lives. Amen. Change is inevitable. Growth is the option. Now, you hear that a lot around here, and so I'm going to ask us to say this together. Change is inevitable. Growth is the option. Nothing stays the same. Almost, almost everything changes. People change, culture change, even rocks change. Almost everything changes, but not everything. There's one thing that never changes. It remains constant. That's God. Hebrews 13 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Beloved, we're seeing a lot of change in our society and in our nation and our world, and, and we cannot and must not look at things the same way. There are a lot of positive changes in our world today, things that probably should have happened a long time ago. But there are also some negative things that are happening uh, and, and uh, uh, that, that reveal the sin that's de in deep inside of us. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to take a look at some of the changes. And we're in this theme that we're calling Reboot, a New Way to Think. And uh, uh, an example of this is um, uh, uh, with all the changing that's going on in the world, we want to rethink the way that we worship. Worship is not going to look the same. In fact, sometimes it's hard to remember what it was like. But, but I'm going to tell you now, it's never going to be quite the same. And uh, we also, with all the events the last few months, we want to, to rethink the way that we reach out to others. There's a lot of tension and anxiety in our world and our culture, and it's causing us to, to rethink the way that we reach out. We're going to have to rethink the way we approach spiritual growth. And this whole idea of social distancing. And it's going to cause us to also rethink about the way we're dealing with our, our personal finances. There's a lot of change, and we need to reboot, we need to, to rethink. Now, not all change is bad. There's been a lot of really good, positive changes that have been a long time coming. And, and, and we get excited about that, but there's also some changes that are not so good. Some bad things have happened, and, and there have been some things that have been destructive and hurtful. Things have been said, things have been done, and, and it's caused a lot of damage to our community, to our, our, our nation, even, even in our world. Ultimately, there's been so much change these last couple of months, it sort of makes you wonder if, if we're ever going to recover, if things are ever going to return to some kind of, of, of normal. It's even hard to remember what things were like just, just a few months ago. And I'm hearing people say things like, well, wouldn't this, wouldn't this be a good time if we sort of just reboot, maybe just turn 2020 off and, and restart all over again? I hear people say things like, it's going to take something really big really big to, to fix all that's gone wrong in our culture these days. It's going to take something huge to turn our nation around once more. Well, one of the core values that we hold dear at First Trinity is that we are, are rooted and relevant. We are, are rooted in the everlasting truth of God's Word. It never changes. And, and, and even though society may change and culture may change, God's Word never changes. And because culture and society change, we want to look at ways we can present this unchanging truth in new and, and relevant ways. Uh, we will continue to look at, at ways we may be able to present the truth of God's Word into a never-hurting, ever-changing culture, but we will never, never change the message of God's grace and love in Jesus Christ. Now, all of us want to make a difference in our world. All of us want to make an impact where we are. And, and we have this in our mind, it's going to take something really big, but, but I'm convinced that the biggest difference we can make are going to be in the little things, in the way we impact lives in little things 
day to day. In fact, I'm, I'm convinced that, that the small actions embedded in the very life of a believer are going to make the biggest difference in the lives of those around us. Uh, in, in other words, we have this ability as we live out our faith to transform our world just one life at a time, just one life at a time through the power of God's living word. Jesus put it this way. He said uh, he, he, in these little things, he said, let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. John put it this way. He said, let us not love in word or tongue, but in action and in truth. Uh, uh, we're going to show our love and demonstrate our faith in the way that we treat other people, in the way that we live out our faith in a way for other people to see. While so much has changed, truth doesn't change. And the way we live out that truth is the way we're going to make an impact in the lives of others, transforming our world one life, just one life at a time, through the power of his word. So the way, the way that we're going to make the greatest impact, beloved, for the kingdom of God, it's not going to be through, through big mass revivals anymore. It's going to be one life at a time. Each of us, each one of us using our gifts and abilities, the way God has equipped us to touch the lives of others. The way we use those gifts and abilities God has given us to, to love and serve other people. Paul put it this way. He said, make my joy complete by having the same mind, having the same love, being of one spirit and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but to the interest of others. God is calling us to put other people before ourselves, to see them as valuable, that they matter very much, and, and he's call, calling us to lift them up and encourage them and love them. And, and people will notice when we genuinely live out our faith in such a way that, that they feel loved and served and honored above others. And so the, the question really becomes, well, what does that look like? How do we honor people that way? How do we serve this way? Again, it's not going to be through the big dramatic acts they're going to cause the biggest change in our world. It's going to be these little regular acts of humility and service. And we're going to see this played out for us in John 13. Now, John 13 is this great chapter on Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And, and this takes place the night before Jesus was betrayed and before he was crucified. And Jesus gathers for one last meal with his disciples. That's all we call it, the Last Supper. And according to Luke's account, right in the middle of this sacred meal, this sacred gathering, this argument breaks out between two of his disciples. And, and, and these two disciples are having this political argument. There's this wonderful meal. And then there's basically this, this political argument about who will have what role in Jesus' kingdom. In fact, even after Jesus rose from the dead, before he ascended back to heaven, they still, they, they still think that Jesus is going to set up some type of political earthly kingdom. This is what they say to Jesus right before he returned to heaven. They said, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? They believed that Jesus was going to come and drive out all the Romans and set up a political earthly kingdom here on earth. So in the midst of this sacred meal, Two disciples have this political argument about their role and position in Jesus' coming kingdom. And the irony of the whole conversation is missed by the disciples. They're so wrapped up in this world's understanding of greatness and power that they completely miss what Jesus is doing for them. It, it, Jesus it, it redefines what greatness and power are truly all about. Now, uh, beloved we see this all the time played out in our culture right now. We see these, these political arguments between groups and between people and, and even played out in our community and our nation about uh, greatness and power. And we see this, this constant arguing as people continue to try to acquire power and control for themselves. They try to raise themselves to places of honor and they, they have this desire to be served. 
And what we need to do is we need to hear what Jesus is trying to, to say to us. This is what he said. It says, the evening meal, this is John 13, and the, the evening meal was in progress. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Sim, Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Jesus has all power right now. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples, his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus' understanding of power and greatness is so countercultural. I mean, his idea of power, his idea of greatness, his idea of influence is so different than our own that, that, that people just have their, a hard time wrapping their mind around it. So Jesus gives this object lesson to help us disciples understand uh, because they're, they're struggling to grasp what power looks like. And greatness looks like humbling yourself and kneeling down and washing feet. Real power looks like humbling yourself and serving those around you. Simple acts of humility and service. Wow, who knew? Again, John records this object lesson taking place and Luke records the conversation that took place during this object lesson. Luke records... Jesus saying, for who is greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who's at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Now, we would all say it's the one at the table who is being served because he's in this position of honor and influence and power. But Jesus says, no, he says it's the one who, who serves. That's why Jesus once said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And give his life as a ransom for many. And we talked about this before. Uh, washing feet was a disgusting job. Uh, in fact, uh, it was so disgusting that it would fall to the lowest of the lowest of the lowest slave. In fact, I read this week that in some provinces, they made it illegal to force slaves to wash people's feet. That's how disgusting it was. And yet, at this meal, we noticed that not only did the disciples not worry about washing their own feet, but they certainly weren't worried about washing somebody else's. And yet, beloved, in this moment, Jesus gets up from the meal and takes a towel and a basin of water and begins to wash your feet. And in this moment, Jesus teaches them and teaches us that the kingdom of God is, is almost always advanced by doing the things that the world considers menial. That the kingdom of God is almost always advanced by, by doing things that the rest of the society thinks is just, just beneath them. It's advanced by humbly serving people in love. These simple, uh, humble acts of service have this power to change the world because it demonstrates the love of Christ living in and through us. Well, the disciples were shocked, just shocked that Jesus would leave that place of honor and do such a, a, a task, like wash your feet. I mean, they, they couldn't understand it. In fact, when Jesus knelt before Peter, Peter said, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, never, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he was bathed, needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you, for he knew the one who was betraying him. And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Now think about this. What is bothering Peter so much? I don't think he really would have cared if one of the other disciples would have gotten up and began to wash people's feet, but Jesus was a different story. I mean, he, did, he didn't understand how Jesus could leave this place of honor at the table and kneel down and wash feet. Peter didn't understand in the moment that what Jesus was doing actually demonstrated what his whole life and ministry were all about. 
uh, that, that Jesus said to him, you, you don't understand now, but soon you will. The whole idea that Jesus would leave his heavenly throne and come to earth to serve. Philippians 2 puts it this way. It says, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, but instead he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. That Jesus would leave his position of honor in heaven, paradise, and he would come down to a sinful, broken, filthy place uh, of earth with wretched humanity so that he could die. Jesus came to serve in humility as he hung on the cross and died for all our sins. It says that he took the, all our sin, which is like filthy rags, and in his place gave us his perfect righteousness. But the good news is, three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, and now we stand before God, the Father, forgiven and clean in the righteousness of Christ. Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. In essence, what he's saying to Peter, Peter, uh, unless you see me as a foot-washing Savior, you will never understand the love that I so desperately want to show you, and you'll never understand the power that comes from serving. Beloved, we live in a culture that, that thinks power and greatness come from, from being served and being in a place of honor, and, and yet what God calls us to is so countercultural that we are to show the world that greatness and power and influence comes not from this place of honor, not from being served, but, but from serving, a place of humility. He calls us to rethink the way that we reach out to others in our pursuit of greatness in this world. Greatness comes from lifting others up. Jesus said, for I gave you this example that you also should do as I did to you. Let's get practical just a moment. I want to give you two ways that we can do this. The first way is to listen. It begins by listening. You know, uh, 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 this is really hard to do. But we need to be able to listen to people, not, and the struggle is because we want to listen, but we're trying to prepare an answer how we want to respond to them, or, or we're, we already have in our mind their life story, but, but God calls us to listen and let them share their experience. In fact, uh, James says, everyone must be quick to hear, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. I got to get back over here. Thank you. I'm just going to stay sitting back down then. What? No, I don't want to stand now. You ruined it for me. Todd Bolsinger said, uh, uh, said uh, who wrote Canoeing the Mountains, a great book. He said, that, uh, that he's talking about the power of listening. He says, we need to get to the point where uh, we, we understand the power of listening. He says, when I go to a meeting, he says, I make it a point to, for every comment I make, I ask two questions that I, I, I don't know the answer to. And he says, that's the best way to do, develop this habit of listening and attuning to others. We need to learn to listen. Let me show you what this looks like. When I was in Kansas City, our family went to vacation to Kansas City a couple weeks ago, and I, I desperately needed a haircut. I mean, I could only wear a man bun for so long. And so uh, uh, I could get a haircut there, so I found a place to do a haircut. I went right after lunch, and the lady that was going to cut my hair was, was visibly shaken. <laughs> and so I asked her a little bit, I said, oh, what's going on? She said, oh, I just got back from lunch. I'm really upset. You know, I... Uh, somebody's yelling at me. I, I, I was wrong. I accidentally cut them off in my car. And I was trying to apologize, but they were too busy yelling at me. And I'm really upset. And, and I'm thinking, well, I don't want someone that, that's upset waving scissors around my head. So I, I got to talk a little bit and ask a couple questions. And I was able to share with her that our identity comes from Christ. And it's not found in the way people respond or react to us that, that, that Jesus determines who we are. 
Because I really, I really wanted her to calm down because, you know, this beauty just doesn't happen by itself. And, and so she, she slowly began to, to be transformed because of the power of God's love and word and began to smile and I was able to get a haircut with a lot less fear. So the first thing we do is we listen, and then once we listen, then we can serve them. Once we listen and we can begin to understand their story, then we have this, this ability to lift them up. I, I'm working it really hard trying to learn to be a, a better listening, but it's not easy. And, but it's when we listen, when we truly listen, then we have this ability to elevate them, to humbly serve them in Jesus' name. This is what Jesus said. If you know these things... If you know them, you're blessed to do them. And we know them. God has given them to us. And then we're able to serve in humility and point them to what really matters. Then we can point them to Jesus Christ who serves them in humility and offers them life. That's what we're after. Jesus has the power to transform our world. To God be the glory always. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, And now... May that peace of God that surpasses all our human understanding keep our hearts and minds forever fixed. Now I'm out of the picture completely.